Welcome to the Blackout Podcast, where I get to talk to amazing people who do amazing things. And today, I have my friend, actor, designer, Amelia Koenig. Thanks for coming to the podcast today. Thanks for having me on. Okay, so, I mean, did you always want to be an actor? Or? Yes and no. Okay. I had my first loves, but I discovered acting around the time I was eight, and that was definitely one of my main passions ever since. And okay, so let's talk about some of those first loves that you abandoned. Uh, they're definitely not abandoned. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. What was some of them? I, I used to love music more than almost anything else. Like singing or? Yeah, like even from the time I was two years old, I'd get up at little family dinners and sing a little little shrinky dinky do. <laughs> and it progressed from there. And I loved just playing instruments in my spare time, writing songs and stuff. So that was that was my first main love. Very childhood into everything else. I always did that. But what instruments did you play? Mainly guitar, piano, clarinet. I dabbled with a few others like ukuleles, um, violin for a second. <laughs> that one is, I think, is, is how do, okay. So, like, with all the instruments you mentioned, which one is the most difficult? Oh, violin. Though. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't yeah. look so difficult, like, because you're pr- pressing the thing and you're still doing the other thing too. You and think, does how you place the thing, the bow, what, what is, is it the thing? The called? bow. The bow. Um, yeah. Does how you place it also count with how the sound comes out, right? That is everything with that sound. You could be doing just about everything right with the fingering hand. And if you're not placing the bow just right, cat in a blender. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of cat in a blender. <laughs> wow. Okay. Do you still play any of the instruments now? I, ever since I switched my focus to acting in 2019, that was definitely most of my time there. But I have still tried to stick in touch with guitar and piano. Those are the main two I'll just dabble with when I get a spare chance. Mm. So I still like to do that in my spare time. Well, I mean, that also adds to your thing, to your acting skills. Like I can, instead of like faking, like I'm playing the guitar, <laughs> I can actually play something. Yeah. Okay. And then eight, what happened at eight? So when I was eight, I was actually at my cousin's house and I'd noticed on her fridge, there was a note about an acting workshop she was attending that weekend. And me being the nosy little bug I am, absolutely had to join her for that. I was like, you're going to something cool. I want to go to that. <laughs> so, so I went. And in a way, I kind of changed my life. I had so much fun with that. It was something I really ended up sticking with for the rest of my life onwards in little ways. Hmm. Mm. What do you recall enjoying about that workshop? We, we did a lot of fun stuff in that workshop. So it was a lot of acting exercises, singing songs. But a highlight for me was getting to read for Molly in a snippet of Annie because we were doing some scene mm-hmm. readings. And that was my first exposure to working and playing with script. I had so much fun with that. Like, I absolutely loved doing that. That was a huge part of that that stuck with me, and I wanted to keep doing. So it was through the Royal Conservatory, the Royal Conservatory of Music program. Back then, they had... Where is that? I was in Newfoundland at the time, so I don't know if that's... Oh, right, 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 right. Um, But yeah, so RCM program. Back then, they had a speech arts and drama branch. So I joined that branch up until they closed that in about... 2011 or 12, which is when I moved to this beautiful province. So you would, what, what was it like a daily, weekly thing you'd do for the other conservatory or? It was at least once a week and a group of us would get together and we'd work on poetry. So later on in my teens, I'd get into poetry competitions. Public speaking was a huge focus of that. So again, when I was into my teens, I'd get into public speaking competitions. And then each year we'd put a play on. So like The Wizard of Oz or Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Those were my first couple. Which of which of all the plays you did, which one did you really enjoy, and what did you enjoy about it? Just in that specific program, or right, in general? Right, just in the specific program. They were also fun. We took some creative liberties with them, but <laughs> I think my very first one, the when we did the Wizard of Oz, it was my very first role, and I even had a line, and it was super cute, and the people were great. It was a very fantastic first experience, and I think that stuck with me ever since. So it's like. If if it sucks, you might not you might not have been doing this now. <laughs> I don't 
think that's the case. I, oh, okay. I still think I would have had fun in ensemble, but I think it was that much more special to me that I had a proper role to play right. in the Right. What was the role? I was a munchkin. Oh, <laughs> That's okay. one of those munchkins that, you know, the house falls on the witch and shocked munchkins, <laughs> look, there's feet. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. It was adorable. Right, right, right. Okay, and then what was the reason behind the move to Halifax? Yeah, I ended up getting into King's Edge Hill School, which is a private school in the Valley in Windsor. So I had to move here to attend that school. But fortunately, I, they have a very rich arts program there. So they had tons of music opportunities. They had tons of theater opportunities. They do two or three shows a year and drama program, all kinds of fun stuff there. So I was able to continue my passions there, which was perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when was the actual, you know, like out of school and now doing it? Fresh out of high school. I, I went to Dalhousie for a moment. <laughs> and What did you study there? I wanted to make my parents proud. So I ended up joining their nursing prerequisites program in their biology faculty. <laughs> <laughs> what? Why? Like, that's so... Whoa, that's so opposite to everything you've done so far. Everything, yep. <laughs> but that's what my parents wanted for me. They wanted oh, me okay. to be in a secure job. They wanted me doing something, you know, most parents want their kids to go into. Something like STEM or becoming a doctor. I'm not quite doctor material. So they're like, <laughs> you know what? You want to be an actor? You know what's an in-demand job like in the States that would get you a work visa there? Nursing. Uh... You should become a nurse. <laughs> So I tried. I gave it the old college try. I did probably one semester before I realized how incredibly demanding of a degree that is. And it just... What was demanding about it? <laughs> <laughs> Everything. Before our finals, I remember getting an email from our microbio prof and they were like, hey guys, your class average is sitting around 53% right now. Class average. Yeah, it was it How was many people scary. In the class? I actually don't totally know because it was one of their online programs. Oh. So we didn't get to see everyone. Right. We didn't get to ask the prof any questions, sort of thing. We were doing a lot of self-learning. So she was saying, in order for us to succeed on these exams, on top of our lectures, on top of tutorials, labs, da 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 da, we should be studying three to four hours a night. Which, if that's your focus, that seems reasonable, but I applied that math to all of the courses we were in. Oh, and a lot of our courses gosh. had tutorials, at least half of them had labs. So if you go to those, you go to your lectures, and you're doing all this studying every single night, it, yeah, yeah. it was approaching like 16 to 18 hours of schoolwork every single day. It's just so incredibly demanding. You have to eat, sleep, and breathe that nursing program if that's mm. what you want. I earned a whole new respect for nurses who go through all that and dedicate themselves to that and push through. That's wow. incredible. <laughs> wow. But that wasn't me because I was trying to run off and go do film film stuff whenever I could. Oh, right, right, right. Oh, oh. so while you were in Dull, <laughs> you were doing film on the side or? Yeah, I was very fortunate that my uh, my writing instructor was Becca Babcock. So she is a person in the film industry. She's a writer. She's an actor. She actually, she just had another n novel published recently. Nice. Yeah, she's doing quite well. But I met her and what a wonderful human to talk to and chat with. And we eventually at some point got on the topic of acting. And she was kind enough to almost like take me under her wing for a second. She showed me the ropes, showed me the who's who of Halifax. You have, you know, your Hennessy casting, your... Facebook groups like Halifax, but spelt with an A-C-T-S at the end. Those sorts of stepping stones that I had no idea existed. I had no idea where to start, how to find them. All I knew mm. was I really wanted to, and I had just turned 18, so I could go do that on my own. Mm -hmm. So she kind of helped set, set me up in that way, like show me the resources, show me the tools, show me how to properly format an acting resume, because I had never seen one of those before, <laughs> which there is a great formatted one on Sky Talent's website under their resource pack. You can see a film and TV resume example. Oh, example. Okay, okay, and, okay. Yeah, just an example. It's those things that someone starting out who has never seen any of these things before, incredibly helpful. It's a nice jump start into meeting that industry standard. So, you know, when you are getting like a normal job, whatever, 
Um, you, you advise not to put your photo on the thing, but is it also the same with the actors thing? You have to put your photo, I'm guessing, right, on your, on your resume? It's a little different. So the resume itself, technically not. So you have your normal resume that oh, would look similar okay. to a work resume, right? <laughs> but if you're going in for an audition, oh. you take your headshot and you staple it to the back of it. So on right. one side you have your resume and right, on the right, other right. side you have your headshot. Uh. So it's still on there, it's just even bigger. Well, so here's the thing though. I've never understood this headshot. Like, what the what it, what is its purpose exactly? Like, just to see what the person looks like because makeup takes care of everything, though. Like most things, at least. Yeah, hair and makeup definitely have a huge role to play on set, and it does make a big difference in appearance. But I think that headshot—it's almost like a first impression without you being in the room. They get to see what you what you look like. They if you have great headshots, they get a glimpse into your personality or the character you're trying to put forward. So they get a feel of who you are and if you would fit into the role that they're looking at putting you in. I believe is the best way I could explain that. <laughs> so, so like, I guess, you know, I guess in my head, right, if I'm acting and I'm going for, say, horror thing, my headshot is still my headshot, though. You know what I mean? Like, am I going to do it a different one for each thing? No. Yes and no. Okay. So when I personally get mine done, I like to go for about five distinctly different looks. What are the looks you do? I'll go for um, an alpha girl. So like your mean girl, your lead, like Regina George kind of vibe. And then you have your beta girl, which is more girl next door. Like uh, Lily Reinhardt's role in Riverdale. She plays Betty. So... The beta would be Betty, and then that alpha would be Veronica, per se. So you have your mean girl, your girl next door, and then I like to go for a professional one. We used to have Digstown here, so I'd do a bit of a lawyer look. That could work for a secretary, a desk job, an assistant, <clears throat> um, a more, you know, lifetime movies. So like a lifetime look. Little your your girl's seen some stuff, crap. Yeah. Not necessarily romance, but just really real and almost dark. Like, she's she's been through some stuff, and maybe that would work for your horror submission. Oh, I see. So, like, the movie <laughs> where the womb... Uh, okay, so there was a movie I watched. And it was based on a real-life story, like, how relationship was the worst. And one day she just had it, and she just sliced his manhood off. It's like... And it's based on a real-life story. <gasps> so it happened in real life. I'm like... And then she threw it away in a piece. And they found it and then they put it back on. No. Yes. No. Yes. Okay, see, your lifetime headshot would probably be good for that. <laughs> and then the final one I'd go for is like a commercial or a Hallmark. So you're very like happy, bright, big white smile. So then when you now read the thing, you decide which one goes. So you already, yeah. so yeah, so you, okay, so. Hmm. So, so it's you like need a first impression. Five. Okay, okay, okay. And then, um, so, you, you you know, you through this lady, your writing instructor, you, you got, like, these agencies. Like, what was the first thing you did or first work you got through that? So she helped me find my first few casting calls. And the first one that I booked was a short film called Boone and Clive by Jacob Pook. It was part of NASCAD's program, no, that was NSCC's program, I believe. <laughs> the two schools, they're very close. They're very, their projects can be a little similar, but I find there are very distinct differences. And the fact that NSCC might have a more professional setup where they're gearing their students towards working in the film industry. So I find the process there is a lot more one-to-one -one with what we'd see on a union shoot. So that was a great first experience because you go in and you actually have a dressing room, like a green room to get ready in. And then you have someone taking you back and forth to set, which is very much what happens on union sets. Whereas NASCAD, College of Art and Design, very much more so artistic. about the art. It's very artistic, which is fantastic. I've seen some really beautiful, amazing films come out of there because of that. And my second film and why I was thinking about NASCAD, the second short film I'd done and my first lead role uh, was a NASCAD production and doing those back to back, those th th very different distinctions <laughs> in how the sets operate, like how the groups work. Mm. In NASCAD, we were just in a big studio and I'd get ready in the corner of the studio and then go over to the set versus NSCC where we have like the separate rooms and a PA. So there are those differences like that, but amazing experiences across both overall. Wow. And uh, I guess... 
okay, so you did this jobs and stuff, and at one point you're like, okay, nursing, goodbye. Yeah, I I definitely did not continue with nursing. I only did the one term for that. And then for my second term, I still wanted to do university to the best of my ability. So it's like, okay, what would be better geared towards what I'm doing, what I'm trying to do, and give me a little more time to go run off and do film stuff. <clears throat> so I switched into their business program, ah. which went well until COVID hit. Everything went online. So that was difficult for you? Or? That I think that was difficult for everyone, right. honestly. And I try not to blame the school too, too much for how that all played out because we were, we were all going through that for the first time. None of us had ever been through a pandemic like that before. So the school tried to the best of their ability to put everything online. It was a difficult process, honestly. Some of the courses were either missing materials or they weren't compatible with MacBooks that we didn't find out till a little bit later. <laughs> so they, they were gracious enough to put some programs in place to help those external factors not negatively affect GPA scores. Right. But it's still such a different, different situation that like A's and B's were turning into B's through D's sort of thing. So I'm like, mm. okay, what can I do to bring my GPA back to where it was before all this online stuff happened? You can do the first year program of just about any, or first year classes of just about any faculty, no matter which faculty you belong to. So I was able to do the first year acting program, which it was the most fun that I'd had. In <laughs> <laughs> so you could have just gone and study. Like, imagine if you studied acting. That what, 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 okay, just picture it. You you got to you went to Dal to study acting. What do you think that would be would have been like for you? I think that would have been really different. And I don't necessarily think I'd be sitting here right now if that were the case. Why not? Um, part of their acting program and actually why I didn't continue with it. If you go beyond the first year, you have to audition, do the callback, which is great. I did all that, but they have an exclusivity contract. What so, is that? You, you can only do only dull stuff. Yeah. That means you, you can't work while you're studying because it's an honors program. You need to be maintaining high grades. So they want you focused on your studies. So you can maintain your high grade. Like <laughs> that's some. Not- it's, n- it's not unnormal and it's not unheard of. The, oh. I, I understood that the film schools, like Toronto Film School, Vancouver Film School, I'd understood they'd had something similar. But I find for those it makes sense because you can still do the student short films. You can still network a little bit. You can still like make some great connections and build a little bit of experience. But Dow's program is a theater program. So not only is the teaching so learning to slightly, be Shakespeare. Exactly. The learning's a little counterintuitive that at That is the same why time. they always do that in auditions. Like, I notice sometimes when you have someone that has gone through theater and you, you kind of have to just tell them to chill. Yeah, because they're so used to having to meet the back of the room. And I, I got notes like that in my first couple of years as well that I was like projecting and being theatrical and animated was a big word that came up because you're trying to light your features up enough that everyone in the room can see what you're doing and receive the message and get those feelings. Um, Film is very different in that sense because instead of from the front and projecting outwards, it's really from the back of your head coming through your eyeballs and you have the frame like right up in your face. So instead of doing all this moving around and big gestures and loud volume, you're having to stay as still as possible and stillness. I think it was Morgan Freeman even said is one of the hardest things you can learn as an actor to be still (laughs) and only show it like through micro expressions through your eyes. Okay. So, so there are people like myself that are like, Oh man, actors have it so easy and stuff. Um, You just kind of show up and everything is ready for you. And you just, what, what are some things that you think people that either don't act or don't understand it, don't get about acting that makes the acting so difficult? I think a lot of under a lot I think a lot of people understand that when we're on set, we're kind of treated like princesses, which amazing and super sweet and sometimes don't really know what to do with that. I'm like, no, no, I can do that. It's fine. <laughs> but what they don't see is everything that happens before you get to set. Acting is like 90% of the work happens before you get to set. And then when you get there, it's kind of like you have to trust the work you've done, trust the tools and almost surrender yourself to that. Drop what you were doing and be present in that moment. So people see you show up, drop everything, 
get ready. No one's allowed to talk to you. If you're the lead, like they'll tell background and everything. Don't look them in the eyes because it'll take them out of it. And everyone just thinks it's this big diva thing. But it's, <laughs> it's true. You're trying to surrender yourself to these tools and the, the work that you've built up before this. It's a lot of script work. Like, I'll try to do a little bit every day. Sort okay, of thing. so what are, what, are, what are some of these work you have to do? Uh, memorization, script yeah, work. Yeah, okay, that one is... Because I write my script on like, wait, oh, fuck, I wrote that. Okay, cool. <laughs> so so what are some tips for memorizing things? Uh, a fantastic resource I'll throw out right now is Acting Career Center on YouTube. That's where I got uh, uh, a lot of my tips. Acting Career Center oh. on YouTube. Okay. Uh, I believe it's with Kurt Yu. It's fantastic, uh, I believe, Atlanta-based actor. But... Uh, he does a lot of stuff that's really helpful for beginners. And one of his videos is seven tips for memorization. And that's where I'd started way back when because I wanted more tips for memorizing faster because a lot of the stuff we get is a little last minute. Mm -hmm. So he'll give you tips like read it before bed so you absorb it overnight or read it like 10 times as soon as you get the script. Like don't look at anything else. Just read the lines flat, no emotion, 10 just times. Just the own lines or the entire script. Like just if I'm acting... Like, whatever. Am I just reading my character's lines or the entire script? Both. Definitely the entire script to get a feel of the story, who okay. the characters are, relationships. But if I would say, like, I've done a couple feature films, so if I'm reading those big scripts, yeah, I'll read absolutely the whole thing um, a handful of times. But beyond that, I'll break it into, like, if I'm not in that scene, I'll definitely have read it so I understand what's happening. But when I'm doing, like, my 10th reread, at that point, I'm only reading the scenes that I'm in. Um, but I will, like action lines, character relations, how different characters are interacting. It's good to know all of that. And then another tip that was in that video for memorization, the margin of the script, like you, know, you have your mm -hmm. left margin, you put the first letter of each word that your character is saying in the margin. So it's like abbreviations. Mm -hmm. And then you cover up the script, but you leave that margin open and you recite your lines only looking at those abbreviations. So every is E and then the next one. And then you have to kind of know where that line ends and where this one starts. Uh, I toss punctuation in mine all the time, commas, periods, dashes. But so say if the lines every day I'm partying, it'll be E, D, I, P. Oh, right, 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 wait, 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 I read it wrong, right. Okay, I see what you're talking about. So it's every word. Yeah, every word. In every line, like in every, you know, basically where you are reading and stuff. So you, you, oh, I get it. I was reading it wrong. I thought, okay, never mind. But that's, okay, yeah, yeah. So you do that, what else? It's like training wheels. Uh, so reading before bed, uh, doing the margin trick, reading it 10 times over, reading it without emotion, so just reading it flat. Um, there's different, like listening to music while you're reading it. So I'll make playlists for my characters. So of course with Tracy, she had her specific song. So like playing that song over and over while I'd read those or chewing gum, that's a specific flavor. And then if you chew that same flavor, it's supposed to help you remember it. So then maybe before you go on set, you might chew some of that gum and then spit it out before you go on set. So if you have a what ninety page script and the film is just two people, four people, so you have tons of lines. How long would it take you to like? Okay, I know everything I'm supposed to say. When that actually was the case for not quite both feature films, but the last one we did only had four characters. The one before that had a total of like six characters. Oh my god! So really? it was very much like that, and I'd say. A good like three to four weeks for me, I felt like ready to go for that. Like I might get the script early September and then we start shooting the first week of October. That's a very comfortable amount of time for me to equate myself with a 90 page script. <laughs> and then you can just like pick up from wherever it is. Yeah, because I like to, instead of learning it as a whole script, I'll break it into their scenes and then just treat each individual one like a scene study, like what we do in class. Your last film, what was the scene you liked the most? A scene that I liked the most. Ooh, I don't know how much I can talk about it, so it might give too much away, but there right. was there was a scene where we were practically in a very small box. It was two of us, and the box was like child size, meant for like one child, but that's that's what we could get our hands on. 
So we had to put both of us. My co-star was six foot two, I think. And <laughs> I'm five nine, almost five ten. So, so we both had to fit in this child box to make it look like what the scene is. <clears throat> and I'm claustrophobic. Oh, how did you so, deal with that? I I was kind of excited because I knew that we'd be able to get some genuine reaction footage and I knew it was something that I could handle. I'd never had I've only ever had one like claustrophobia panic attack, so I know roughly what my limits are for that. So I was kind of excited. We got in the box and we did the scene, but then <laughs> instead of cutting and Ron loves to do this. It usually works out quite well. Instead of cutting, he let us stay there in that box until like, just to see what would happen. We were screaming, there was crying. <laughs> <laughs> like we had pillows under us. So when we got up, the pillow was like half his sweat and half my whole face of makeup. <laughs> it's just this hot tight box. I'm screaming and wailing and crying. I'm like, holy snap, get me out of here. <laughs> but then we got to see how that worked in the film. And I think it worked really well for getting that genuine emotion and genuine fear to come across. So, um, I mean, working with, as an actor, you have to work with different people, specifically directors. What are some of the, I guess, signs you look for that, okay, this is going to be a good relationship, and then what makes it a good relationship with your directors? I am still an actor baby, so my response to this probably doesn't have as much weight as it will once I've gotten more on-set experience, but so far... I've noticed the best sets I've been on are the ones where people are very communicative and kind and appreciative towards the people around them. So I, I know I'm going to have a great day if the people like in power, like the higher ups around me are treating the people around them super human and mm. like super kind, like, oh, thank you so much for getting this, even though it's someone below them. If, if I see that early on, I, I generally feel relatively at ease for how the day is going to go versus if I come to set and I see that there's an AD running around kind of screaming at people like, get this, where's this? Why don't I already have this? Where is this person? Just more abrasive about it. I'm a little more like, okay, we're having a set day today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do you handle situations like that? Mostly with professionalism. That's like, if I'm on a set where everyone's comfy and chill and we're chatting, just kind of like this, I'll be more laid back and I'll bust out some card tricks and we'll all have a fun time. But then if we're on a set where everyone's a little more like, okay, you're not, you're getting paid enough to not care about how you're being talked to sort of energy. Right. That's where I'll be a little more professional. It's like, okay, I'm just going to sit here with my script and when you need me, you'll, you'll come get me and I'll be ready to go. Okay. Wow. Yeah, I can't do that. That's on bullshit. That's no. <laughs> I, you know what? <laughs> I think that's why I always want to make sure I'm producing my own things because, like, I want it to be fun. Like, no, I don't. I don't like when people treat people like, oh, you know, you are below the line and blah blah blah. No, man. Because at the end of the day, the person is still a person, right? Exactly. And I just think everyone. Whether you're the one that's making all the money and this person is barely making, you know, minimum wage, it doesn't matter, right? Everybody's a human being and, like, you don't know what a person might bring to your set anyway. Yeah, and they could even be starting out. You have no idea how they're going to grow from there. Like, someone who wants to be an AD and has the potential to be a really great AD one time, if they're just starting out trying to get their foot in the door, they might go in as a PA. And if you're in the lowest possible PA role... I've seen some of them not get treated that great or even like PAs in charge of background actors. The people above that PA might treat those background actors almost like cattle or sheep or children. Like I've, I've been on sets doing background where we were talked to as if we were children. <laughs> <And> <laughs> it feels almost dehumanizing. Like I, there's right. been some situations like that. And I just, you don't know how the person could grow in that role. And if they have such a bad experience as a PA and being mm. talked to, like you're getting paid enough to not care what we're saying to you, which has been the attitude on a couple larger sets that I've experienced. Right. That person could totally drop that and not go back, not PA again, not continue to climb that ladder. Mm. A lot do, which is great. And they do really well with that. But it hurts my heart to think about the people who just totally drop it because of how the people around them on set treated them mm -hmm. and then never get to realize that potential and reach that dream goal of theirs. Wow. 
Okay, so I mean, you act and stuff, but do you ever see a situation where you might write, direct, produce? Yes, I would love to. I have a couple egg babies that I would love to eventually bring to light, and I know for those projects, they they're very close to my heart, and I. At, at a minimum, I think I'd like to either be the person producing it, and of course, I, I'd want to act in them, <laughs> but because I'd want to act in them, I don't think I could see myself acting, writing, producing, and directing, like someone wearing all that hat, all those hats, super people. That okay. would be incredible, but I think for me, I'd want to find some people close to me who I know work really well in those positions and like bring on... Like, one of my close friends is a director, and I'd, I could see myself bringing her on because I would trust her with my baby sort of thing mm. and be like, okay, can you direct this in a way that I'd love to... So, you know, I'd want to produce it, bring someone close to me on to direct it so that I could... In a way that I could talk to them about the directing happening. Mm. Um, and then, as much as I would love to write it, I know realistically I'm not a professional writer. I'm not Madame Be Becca Babcock. <laughs> I would love to be, but that's not my strong suit necessarily. So I'd love to, again, bring on a writer or two that would be open to working with me to bring these concepts to fruition in a very skilled way. Um, <laughs> can you share me one of these stories, maybe? Sort of. I won't give too, too much away, right, right, but right. one of them is based off of my D&D &D OC, original character, so Dungeons and Dragons. Right, 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 right. I used to play, like, through my, te through my teens, I used to play it a lot, like, every few days or once a week. We'd spend, just sit down, whole six hours on a campaign, and for each campaign, almost, I've used the same character that I've mm. been building since I was probably, like, 14 sort of thing like I've designed her wardrobe she has a whole backstory and originally I'd made all of these like fleshed out characters for these campaigns and her backstory and the map of where she's from the kingdoms adjacent to her and I realized all the information I'd fleshed out not that useful for these campaigns made by other people right. it's just useful for her character but I was like hey I've already fleshed all of this stuff out. I've fleshed out her relationships. She has an arc. She has a, a storyline, basically. There's there's an objective. There's obstacles to overcome. There's a region already mapped out. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd done all of those base works. So now I'm looking at how can we flesh this story out in a way that would be captivating in a film TV setting. But there's also aspects to that that I wouldn't want to touch until I was a little further along and had more access to mm. higher level tools. Like, it would be really cool to do a little bit of CGI for a fantasy film, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So definitely some projects in the works, but nothing that would ever see the light of day for years and years to come. <laughs> no, but like, okay, meanwhile, you're still acting. Talking about acting, what's the next thing you'll, you'll be working on? I, I'm, I'm actually working on a feature film on this week which is fun but and nothing crazy not big rules or anything but I'm, I'm excited to do some of that but I'm really looking forward to the opportunities that are going to come up over this next year because I think I want to tackle more work that would bring me closer towards joining the union at this point I've been doing this a few years now I've really enjoyed what I've done I've gotten a couple feature film leads under my belt now. I, I think I'm ready for that next step to kind of get into more union work. But for now, adoring short film projects like Home Visit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess what are some of the steps to get into the union? For a union, you have to get uh, union level credits. Uh, I believe it's three, but once you get your first one, you can become an apprentice. So for me, I've never had an actual like actor actor role on a big union production so i've never qualified for that credit yet i've only been doing non-union work or if i work on a union set i'm either photo doubling or background or team two or just something not featured if that makes sense so basically you have to be on the call sheet for them to count not even because i'm technically even if you photo double you're on the call sheet right i mean but sorry you have to get it like a, a name credit. name yeah yeah basically yeah. your name like the character you're playing has their name in the thing exactly an acting credit okay so i think that's what i'm hoping to shoot but that's where you can like produce your stuff what so are they saying if you produce then you can just 
Well, it has to be a union thing. Yeah, so the production also has to qualify for That's union. Some <laughs> it's, a, it's a slight catch twenty two. Am I using that right? right. Yes, yes, because <laughs> you have to like do this, or but you can't do this without doing that. Exactly. To book a union role, you have to be union for the most part because they have a set number of union seats they have to fill per union production, and the only way. To get union status is to get a role in a union production. So Which you have like, to fight. They have to go through every single union person, and then it's like, okay, we still haven't filled these. Let's look at the non-union people. So you're going up against all of the union people, all the non-union people. It's a little crazy. I think wow. there's like maybe a five percent chance of landing it, if that, because I think five percent is what a lot of actors would be looking at for their booking success. In larger markets, I feel like that would be a little more cushioned here where we're a smaller community. Mm. But that's crazy. Very hard to do. And we don't have all that many huge union productions coming here. Fortunately, we've been seeing a little more over the past few years, which phenomenal. I'm very excited about that. And I'm really hoping that that will bring those opportunities to the non-union actors here. Wow. Okay. It's always great talking to you. Uh, but I don't want to keep you too long. So I'm going to end it with this question. Okay. <clears throat> when you know it's all said and done, I mean, acting is a job, right? Mm -hmm. And what is something about it that makes you keep doing it, even when it's difficult? Or you're one of those sets where there's, there's an asshole in there. Like, what makes you keep doing it with everything involved? I think for me, that would be reigniting my passions as regularly as possible. So part of what, why I got into acting is I'm obsessed with TV. I'm obsessed with movies. I was constantly trying to run off to the theater with my mom. Like in high school, we might go once or twice a week. Now with our current economic situation, we're looking more like once every two to three weeks, but still going as regularly as possible. And every single time I go, it reignites that flame in me. Like I could leave a movie with a whole other mindset or a whole new drive. Like that was amazing. I want to be on that screen doing that for other people, making people feel those things. I'm obsessed with how acting can trigger the feelings inside, not just acting, but how the whole thing's put together. It takes the score, the acting, the editing, how all of that comes together and pulls these emotions out of you like mm -hmm. disney using algorithms to make you water work at that very specific like three quarter to four fifths mark of the movie <laughs> <laughs> it's it's insane and i love learning more about that and i want to be doing that for other people so if i have a bad set experience or i'm just getting so burnt out on script work i will take a beat i'll watch a bunch of netflix i will go to the cinema and that will remind me why I'm doing what I'm doing because I want to see myself up there one day doing that for other people. Wow. Before we wrap, can I do one little thing? Yeah. Okay, but you have to close... You, you, oh, my mic, got it. Thing. You have to close your eyes, though. I have to, Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, can I open it now? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Is it time yet? No. No? Oh, I have my magic cards. Yes! <laughs> and I know the magic. And I can do it with my own cards. Okay, mm -hmm. this is a great way to end this episode. Thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. I appreciate you. Thank you for coming. And I can actually do the magic here. I can't do it, and I'll do it off camera, <laughs> but I can't do it. Thank you so much, Amelia. Thank you for having me on. This is a great time. Mm -hmm.